Hello, and welcome to How to Succeed with Predictive AI. I'm Abby Lundberg, Editor-in-Chief at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be moderating the event. Machine learning is the engine of predictive AI, yet too many machine learning projects fail at deployment. Generally, that's because they're viewed as technology rather than business projects. And organizations often fail to foster the crucial connection between business and technology functions. Our speaker today is a leading expert in the effective and profitable use of predictive analytics and machine learning. Eric Siegel is the author of the newly released book just in the last couple of days called The AI Playbook, Mastering the Rare Art of Machine Learning Deployment. He'll explain what business stakeholders must do to succeed with AI. Eric is a consultant and former Columbia University and UVA Darden professor. And in addition to the AI playbook, he's the author of the highly acclaimed Predictive Analytics, The Power to Predict Who Will Click by Lie or Die. And he's also the founder of the Machine Learning Week Conference. Welcome, Eric. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm very excited to speak to you about the... Uh, a uh, problem and potential with machine learning deployment where it's routinely failing to deploy. But um, here's what I think is the antidote. So first, in 20 seconds, here's why predictive AI or predictive analytics is important. Business needs prediction. Prediction requires machine learning. And machine learning depends on data. Let's put that in reverse. You start with data. You give it to machine learning, also known as predictive modeling. And it generates from that data, it learns from the data, a predictive model that then produces predictions, which is why we also refer to these enterprise use cases of machine learning as predictive analytics or predictive AI. In that way, we in these types of use cases, that's where you have the potential to improve almost any large scale existing um, operation. And so it delivers these benefits, boost sales, we cut costs, combat risk, prevent fraud, fortify healthcare, streamline manufacturing, conquer spam, and win elections. As Morgan Vodder put it in the forward to my new book, The AI Playbook, machine learning's practical deployment represents the forefront of human progress, improving operations with science. So in a nutshell, predictive modeling, machine learning methods, learn from data, they create what I depict in these slides as a golden egg. And the golden eggs are the predictive models that are then meant to be deployed to integrate into existing operations and better target marketing, sales activity, fraud detection, et cetera, changing operations in order to improve them. That's the deployment. That's the operationalization. That's where you actually realize and capture value from the number crunching. But routinely, they, they fail. In fact, um, most new enterprise machine learning projects fail to re reach deployment and therefore fail to capture value entirely. Uh, IBM recently came out with re uh, industry research results saying that the average returns on AI projects is lower than the cost of capital. And in my own um, uh, work participating uh, to help produce a couple um, uh, industry surveys to data scientists, the data scientists turn out to say that, tell the same story. They make the model with the intention of deploying it, and then so often it fails to get deployed. Basically, stakeholders get cold feet. If they don't get their hands dirty, their feet get cold. That'll be the theme today. So really, we have a major unmet need in the industry, which is that there's no established, well-known, widely adopted paradigm, practice, framework, playbook for running machine learning projects end to end from, con from inception to successful deployment that's well known to business stakeholders. And in fact, in general, business stakeholders haven't quite realized that it takes a very particular specialized practice, which I'll be outlining today. And secondarily, and maybe more fundamental, in order to participate end to end in that life cycle of the project, the business side must collaborate deeply and first ramp up on a certain semi-technical understanding of what it means to integrate, to deploy a, a predictive model, its predictions. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by exactly what that semi-technical understanding is today. 
So I'll start out by defining machine learning, predictive analytics, predictive AI briefly, but then in the red, we've got the problem and the green is the solution, right? So ML projects are routinely failing to deploy. I'll cover that semi-technical understanding. And then with that understanding, the stakeholders could then participate in the end and practice paradigm that I call biz ML, business practice for running machine learning projects. So let's turn to the definition. I'm reading this book, machine learning to my son. His name's Caius. He's, he's now much older. He's now uh, three and a half. Um, that's a real book, which I highly recommend for babies, but not for toddlers, because I really didn't like the definition. And there's a lot of definitions thrown around around these terms. Let, let's turn to a, a more concrete definition. Well, first, a more informal definition, but a step in the right direction is actually the full long title of my first book, Predictive Analytics, The Power to Predict Who Will Click, Buy, Lie, or Die. Let's turn to a little bit more concrete actionable, um, practical definition, machine learning and these types of predictive enterprise use cases. It's technology that learns from experience, learns from experience. Okay. By experience, I mean data. Data is a collection uh, of, of uh, incidents that have occurred. It's a long list of prior events. It encodes the collective experience of an organization from which it's possible to learn to predict, to generate a model to predict the outcome or behavior of each individual. And by individual, I mean humans or otherwise, a certain low level granularity for, from the organizational perspective. Customers, patients, business, vehicles, image, equip, piece of equipment, other individual units, transactions that could be fraudulent, locations you might drill for oil, satellites that might run out of battery. Any and all individual um, outcomes or behaviors on that individual level in order to drive better decisions, and that's the rub, that's where you're actually acting on it, that's the deployment piece. So each individual you see at the bottom gets a number, usually in the form of a probability, it's a predictive score, and the higher the number, the higher expected chance that that individual will click by lie or die, commit an act of fraud, any outcome or behavior of which there may be uh, value for improving operations, which generally consist of many individual decisions. Prediction is the holy grail for that. So now that I've sort of defined the area and these types of use cases, I'd like to ask you all to quickly um, respond to a poll. And I've broken it down to four options with regard to your background and experience with these types of enterprise machine learning projects. Uh, you've never been involved with a machine learning project. You've been involved with one, but it didn't deploy, which is not uncommon. You've been involved with them and most deployed, but didn't necessarily show proven value, or you've had mostly successes. You've been involved, most did deploy, and most did have established proven um, business value. Okay, so, okay, th this is great. So the intention today is really to be accessible for anybody who's not been involved with machine learning. Um, and in fact, that's what I'm talking about. It's a meta discussion. What is it that we need? We all need to learn in order to participate. So that's great that more than half of you have never been involved. And indeed, of those who have been, you see this skew where there's a majority of cases where they tried but didn't quite get deployed. So there's a certain disconnect, and that's really what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so thank you, Sean, if you could go back to the slides. So the main two technical steps of a machine learning project, the sort of culminating steps are to create the model, to learn from the data. That's the number crunching. That's the main rocket science. And that's what I'm showing on this slide. So data is, is input into the machine learning software, predictive modeling software, and it generates this golden egg predictive model. And then in, in the second sort of culminating step, um, you're deploying the model, you're acting on it, you're using it to make predictions and then acting on the on the prediction. So technically for each individual, whether it's an individual human or a car that might ha need, need uh, repair or a train wheel that might be faulty, whatever it is on that level of detail, you take characteristics of that individual's input. This is where you're using what's been learned. You're acting on or applying what's been learned. The model then takes that information about one individual at a time and then generates the predictive score for that one individual. So those are those are the sort of two culminating technical steps, right? So the, the problem is in getting that second part deployed where you're actually producing those predictions and acting on them, right? We have this unmet need and here's the rub, which is that sort of both sides, both 
data professionals and business professionals, the data scientists, the machine learning experts who actually operate the machine learning software and prepare the data for it, and their clients, the stakeholder, the people in charge of running large scale operations that stand to be improved with predictive model um, uh, deployment, both kind of point to the other side and say, this, this kind of running or management or business level process is not my job. And I'll get, I'll clarify where that is, but it sort of rests in the no man's land. And this is the last main remaining ingredient before we can get more wide scale success and deployment. And part of the problem is that what we're talking about is probabilities and acting systematically over many probabilities. Because the output, what I've been calling a predictive score, really is just a probability, a value between zero and one or zero and a hundred, same thing that says, how likely is this outcome for this particular individual? You can think of a predictive model that's been generated from the data. Also, you could think of it as a probability calculator for that individual, for whatever you're trying to predict for this project. So by the way, just to be clear, so by, by predict, we really just mean put a probability on. I should also be clear that by predict, we don't just mean literally predicting the future, the outcome or behavior that will happen in the future, but the word also applies for a situation or a diagnosis. Does, does this healthcare patient have this diagnosis? Should they be given a positive diagnosis? Is this transaction fraudulent? You know, or is it legitimate? It's not exactly the outcome or behavior in the future, but the same, we use the word predict either way, predict whether the transaction is fraudulent. So just to be clear on that. So here's the problem with um, probabilities. You know, The world's not exactly so friendly and excited to adopt them. There's a certain intimidation and, and, and technicality that seems to shroud them, right? So let's go to Empire Strikes Back and the helpful robot, C-3PO, hey, sir, you know, there's only a one in 3,029 to one chance that we're going to survive navigating through this asteroid field. And then our hero, Han Solo, never tell me the odds, right? And I'm like, thanks, George Lucas. You're not, you know, you're kind of giving this stuff a bad name. So now let's turn to maybe not quite as popular movie, but a, but a very popular movie, Moneyball, based on the book where the Oakland A's baseball team turned out to do uh, much better than anybody expected because they were acting on and successfully deploying the number crunching and the analytics and the probabilities about which which players to put up to bat first and 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 all these decisions that go into uh, running a, a a baseball team during the game. Um, the thing is, is that although this movie celebrates the math and its successful deployment, it's also the epitome of glossing over the math. Right. So how far have we gotten into sort of bridging this gap, um, you know, in that between the beauty and the geek, right, between the the manager and the data science? Can you can you guess which actor um, played the data scientist in this movie? Now, in terms of sort of more pop science, we've got Nate Silver's very famous book, Signal in the Noise. And it espouses probabilistic thinking as a general thing, but it's mostly focused on more what I would call forecasts, where it's one-off predictions. Which way is this uh, uh, political election going to go? Is the economy going to go up or down? Rather than lots of individual predictions, and that's the defining characteristic of these uh, predictive use cases. That's why it's so actionable, because those predictions directly inform each individual case. So we need to think not just about probabilistic thinking, but a much more rare concept at this point, which is probabilistic doing, right? Systematically acting on probabilities repeatedly over many, many individual cases. Um, here's another example where probability was misunderstood. Nate Silver's prediction of the 2016 presidential campaign, right? where at the last minute he gave Hillary Clinton a 71% chance and then she lost. And everyone says, the death of data and his model's terrible, whatever. Not at all. You know, if, if Trump had a 29% chance of winning, that's far from a long shot. That means almost one out of three cases that look like this will have that outcome. In fact, a 29% is closer to a 50-50 toss-up than a sure lose. It it the, the takeaway from uh, that particular number, 29%, is uncertainty, right? And in that way, his model succeeded. It said, Ugh, can't make a very clear call. Other models, by the way, were saying 99% Clinton. Maybe those were overconfident. Um, but he kind of got um, 
uh, chastised unfairly in the media. And I think it's from a widespread misunderstanding of simply what a probability is. Seven out of 10 is not definite. Three out of 10 is not a long shot. But let's get a little more specific about what it means to deploy a machine uh, a machine learning model for enterprise use case. Um, this is where I'm going to start telling you about this semi-technical understanding that all stakeholders need to understand. And it comes down to simply three things about how this probability, what the probability means and what it's going to do. What's predicted, how well, and what's done about it. Which to data scientists technically are known as the dependent variable, the metrics, and the deployment. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of these just to make it concrete. But what we're talking about here isn't the rocket science, it's how to make use of, how to capitalize the rocket science, what you need to understand about how it's gonna change your business. So for example, one of the probably two main marketing applications of a predictive model is response modeling, where you're predicting who's gonna buy, will the customer buy if contacted, for all the examples I'm going to be giving, it's a yes, no prediction, a, a, a binary prediction. Will the customer buy if contacted? Yes or no. And then what's done about it? Okay, for those above a certain threshold of probability, like kind of likely enough to buy, then send a brochure. And just think about that for a second. I'm not saying they have to be 99% chance of buying. If the overall population has a 1% or often it's like a 0.1% chance of responding, right? Most direct mail is junk mail. It goes right into the recycling container. But if you find a pocket that's five times as likely to buy, maybe they're only 5% likely to buy. You don't have a definite prediction of whether or a confident prediction of whether they'll buy, but you've tipped the odds. So that's what you're, that's, that, that's the numbers game you're playing. So in this marketing example, you're looking at an individual customer today saying, hey, should I expend the cost of contact? Should I send them a brochure and spend $2 contacting them? If I do, what's the probability of a positive outcome? And I'm going to use that to drive the decision. Now, let's turn for a moment to metrics. If you took all of your prospects for this marketing example and you scored them with a predictive model, how likely are they to buy if contacted, and then order the list from, from most likely to buy down to least likely. That would correspond to the left to right, the x-axis of this um, profit curve. So what this curve shows you, the, the top curve, is that as you start contacting those most likely customers, your profit is going up pretty steeply because you're relatively speaking, getting a lot of responses relative to the expenditure of contacting them. Then you kind of reach diminishing returns. And then the, and then the, uh, curve starts to go down. You're only losing money as you continue to contact people because you're just not getting enough responses. So obviously when you see a curve like this, you might say, okay, well, let's stop at uh, 20%. We're going to maximize our profit. Great. We're going to only mark into the top 20%. So a couple things about this curve. First of all, it doesn't tell you absolutely what to do with deployment. It, it informs the decision. It tells a story of what would happen if you happen to be actually contacting them in that order. In practice, you don't actually contact them in that order, but by showing in that order, it makes you decide where you trying to draw that line. So for example, you might not want to draw the line 20%. You might say, hey, let's go all the way over to 72% where we break even. We can effectively market to 72% for free, arguably a lot better than marketing to 100% and costing us $550,000. So it tells a story. It turns out that this kind of graph, which shows a business metric, a KPI, which is the profit of the marketing campaign, is very, very rare. In practice, only technical metrics that, that report on the absolute performance of the model, how well does it predict? Uh, so I'll get into some examples of that. But um, the problem, one of the main disconnects is that we need to move to metrics that relate directly to business value like this. So the most popular metric that you always hear is about accuracy. And it turns out that accuracy is usually impertinent and misleading. And I call this the accuracy fallacy. And there's a lot of overblown headlines that use the word accuracy and imply predictive performance that's infeasible and overblown. So here's, for example, real headlines. AI can tell if you're gay. Artificial intelligence predicts sexuality from one photo with startling accuracy. Linguistic analysis can accurately predict psychosis. 
AI powered scans can identify people at risk of a fatal heart attack almost a decade in advance. This scary AI has learned how to pick out criminals by their faces. So the problem with these headlines is that they convey that the model can predict with very high confidence for both positive and negative cases and usually be right about it for both types of cases. But for these types of outcomes or behaviors, especially human behaviors, that will require clairvoyance. We don't have clairvoyance. We can't expect computers to have them either. So let me break that down a little bit with one of the particular examples, the Stanford study that predicts sexual orientation. In their data, 93% were straight. So if the model just always predicted straight and never predicted gay, it would be correct 93% of the time. That's a 93% accuracy without ever correctly identifying somebody in the, in this case, the minority class, which is gay. But their claim was 91% and out of context, it conveyed to casual readers, to lay readers, even technical readers who weren't looking at the details of the technical paper that this thing could tell from a photo what your sexual orientation was Whereas, no, it couldn't. So let me let me be a little more specific. If you tune the model to use it to correctly identify two-thirds of the members of the minority group, which are gay in this case, and for this particular example, which it could do, but only with a really high false positive rates, of all the times it actually outputted gay, it would actually be wrong half the time. And if you wanted to identify more than two-thirds, it would be wrong even more frequent in um frequently so there's this problem when something happens less than 50 percent of the time if it's a minority thing that you're trying to predict which is the case for most uh applications that's a hard thing to correctly predict with high confidence the accuracy fallacy has been perpetrated over a huge number of cases heart attacks and whether there's a disease in the corn crop and Alzheimer prediction and a million of these examples. So I've got an article in the Scientific American blog, the accuracy fallacy. By the way, you will you're you have access to the PDF of these slides. Please take note that when you download them, in the top right there's a little comment thing and then you'll see the notes that were in my original PowerPoint file below the slide, but they're in the top right little corner click thing. And for a lot of these slides, they'll, you'll get the link to the original article or some additional information, including this slide. This topic is also the opening of the metrics chapter of my book, The AI Playbook. So let's talk about this. I've been saying there's these metrics. Accuracy is actually just a technical metric. Other, other very commonly used ones are precision recall and something very popular called area under the curve. Those, these, are the, these are the only metrics that data scientists generally work with. And, and they only tell you the relative absolute performance, predictive performance of the model, you know, relatively compared to, say, a baseline of random guessing. And the fact that it does better than guessing is indicative of potential value. But let's also measure the actual value in business terms, profit, ROI, savings, numbers of customers acquired or saved. This is a move that absolutely needs to take place. And in fact, it's the very topic of a new article that just got published on, on Sloan Management Review yesterday, what leaders should know about measuring AI project value. So I really get into that in the article, um, the difference between business and technical, why technical dominates wrongly. And we have to also be looking at these business metrics. So let's look at one particular example with fraud detection. And by the way, here's here's those two pieces, what's predicted and what's done about it to define this enterprise use case. Uh, you predict whether a transaction is fraudulent, and then if it's likely enough to be fraud, well, then you're going to either put a hold on it or you're going to audit it, right? Uh, there's some action to be taken based on that predicted probability. So the problem is you're trying to find this balance between false positives and false negatives. In the case of fraud detection, a false positive it says it's fraud, but it's not. That's, that's, those are two different kinds of errors, right? So now the cardholder has been inconvenienced. That costs something to the bank. Whereas the other error is probably worse. It says it's not fraud, but it actually was, which means the, by the time they realize it, it's too late, the criminal got away with it and the bank has to eat the cost of the loot. So I'm just going to skip. I'm going to give you a real brief tour of some arithmetic and leave you if you want to dig into the details. The takeaway here is that it's just arithmetic. It's not rocket science and it's not calculus. It's just arithmetic to translate the value of 
the performance of this model from a technical metric to, in this case, cost savings um, using the fraud detection model for card payment card transaction fraud detection. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so if you had a, a medium-sized bank that had issued 100,000 cards and uh, and one out of 1,000 cases were fraud 0.1%, then you would have, um, it turns out, about a $50 million cost to the bank if there's no fraud detection. So here's the savings with fraud detection. You could actually save $34 million. And the calculations, I'm not going to step through these in detail, but the calculations are basically you get this fraud detection model. It does It predicts a lot better than guessing. It usually when it predicts fraud, it's actually not fraud. Fraud's so infrequent, it's very hard to predict it correctly without also incorrectly predicting it a, a lot of the time. But still, if it only happens one out of a thousand times, and yet almost half the times you predicted it actually is fraud, that's a really good rate. And if you do the math and add up those false positive and false negative costs, it turns out that in aggregate, you're going to save uh, $16 million. Um, so the cost is going to go from 50 to $34 million if you take into account those two different kinds of errors and the costs of them. So I'll leave it to you if you want to dig in. You can also go to this spreadsheet, which is the same example. And you can also look at the slow management review article that published yesterday, same example, if you want to see what that math is. But my main point here is it's not rocket science, not even calculus. It's just arithmetic. <clears throat> Okay, so let's get into, so as I mentioned, it's what predicted, how well, that's the metrics, what's done about it. What's predicted and what's done about it, that defines the use case. Should I drill for oil here? What's done about it? Decide whether to drill for oil, right? Uh, is this credit applicant likely to be um, a bad debtor? What do I do about it? Decide whether to actually approve their application for credit, right? That that what's predicted and what's done about it, that's the pair that defines the business value proposition and the business use case. But the first of those two, the prediction goal, is where you start to, start to actually dig into a good amount of detail. So you can't just predict for response modeling, will the customer buy if contacted? You have to say, let's get really precise about what we're predicting for the purposes of this project. Well, okay, if center brochure, will the customer buy within 13 business days, you have to set a time window, with a purchase value at least this amount, $125 after shipping, and not return the product within for, re for refund within 45 days. You have to put in all the qualifiers and caveats. They're business relevant. They're pragmatic. They can't be informed by a data scientist operating in a vacuum. This is where you need collaboration, buy-in, understanding from business side stakeholders participating in the project. So what's predicted, how well, what's done about it actually corresponds with the first three of the BizML paradigm that I that I lay out in the book and that I'm espousing in general as, as what really we need. I'm issuing a clarion call. We need a standardized framework paradigm for businesses to follow and an understanding for need for one in the first place. So those three factors that define the project and that uh, where business stakeholders have to get involved and understand some of the concrete details correspond to the first three steps. Establish the deployment goal, which is that pair, what's predicted, what's done about it. Establish the prediction goal, which is the first of those two, but get a lot more specific about it. And then establish which metrics pertain and what your standards are for those metrics. Then the other three are the main three technical steps of any machine learning projects. Two I've already mentioned. Prepare the data, train the model from that data, right? Learn that golden egg model from the data and then deploy it, actually start using it to make predictions and acting on those predictions to improve operations. This requires change management, right? We need to, this deployment means change to existing operations, not just number crunching. Right now, the world focuses on the number crunching, the rocket science part. This is the awesomest kind of technology. Most sci data scientists like me, and I, got been in, in machine learning for more than 30 years, totally got into this because that is the coolest kind of technology, learning from data to find trends and patterns that hold out in general. It's really, really, in, in that sense, the computer literally learns because it discovers things that are real, not just particular to the data, but that hold in general in, in new unseen situations. It's the cool science, but right now we focus entirely on that instead of its use, right? And in fact, that's sort of the that's sort of the syndrome. Students 
data science students come in and they flock straight to head hands on. What they want to do is load the data. And this is the first thing most books and courses cover, load the data and start making a model. But no, that, that skips all those pre-production steps, those business steps to establish exactly what you're predicting and why. And then that definition in full detail of what you're predicting, which is then, by the way, manifest by the data prep. The data is not going to prepare itself. So you can't skip over that stuff. It sends a false narrative and it has us focusing too much on the technology. Now, data scientists are going to say, no, 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 this isn't my job. My job is just to make the model. Um, those are management issues. Of course, the model generates self-evident fact. It's valuable. It'll be deployed. Are they crazy? Whereas the business professional saying, no, 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 those details, what's predicted, how well was done about it. I delegate all the details of this project, which sound really hairy, intimidating to my experts, the data scientists. So therefore, the hose and the faucet are failing to, to connect. It's so ironic. By focusing so much on the on the model, the modeling science rather than its deployment, it's like being more excited about rocket science than the launch of the rocket. That's where we are in the world. The business professional also says, well, well, to drive a car, I don't need to look under the hood, which is true. I also have never looked under the hood. I don't know how to change a spark plug. But to drive, you do need expertise, momentum, friction, how a car operates, rules of the road, expectations of other custom, of other drivers and how they expect you to behave. Um, that's a very particular amount of expertise. You need that, that analogous expertise to run, to drive a machine learning project successfully through to deployment. More than anything, enterprise machine learning projects don't need better technology, they need you. They need you after you've ramped up on the semi-technical understanding to participate deeply in the end-to-end -end project. That's the missing ingredient, it's you. And it's, I, I can't cover all of it in, in a half hour. You know, it's basically a book's worth. That's why I, why I wrote the AI playbook. So to wrap up, we need to reframe machine learning projects. Right now it's focused, it's considered a technical project which consists of these technical steps, prep the data, train the model, and deploy it. It's missing the whole other side of the project, the business side, right? We need BizML or something like that. We need everyone to understand that there's a particular framework and end-to-end -end practice that we're all on the same page and participating, collaborating deeply together from end-to-end -end with business side stakeholders who've ramped up. So it's not two-sided project it's a first and foremost it's a business project that has a technical component we need we should rename machine learning projects to operations improvement projects that use machine learning as a, a critical technical component it's a business project first so that's these are my conclusions gain a semi-technical understanding what's predicted how well what's done about it you need to get into that level of detail when the stakeholders don't get their hands dirty in that respect they get cold, their feet get cold. And that's what happens. The project dies because it, it fails to get approved for deployment. And then with that understanding in place, follow this specialized playbook, a practice, end to end, the whole life cycle needs that deep collaboration. <clears throat> so that's what I cover in the book. I'll land on this during Q&A because this is what I'd like you to meditate on. Um, I'll also mention that... Um, I've been running this conference, Machine Learning Week, since 2009, formerly Predictive Analytics Worlds, first week of June in Phoenix. And our, we have a new sister conference, the a, uh, uh, Generative AI World. So with that, um, I'll give it back to Abby, and if we can have uh, some questions. Great, Eric. Tons of uh, great comments and questions coming in from the audience. And I'm going to start out with um, the couple of questions around you know you've clearly you've clearly articulated that this needs to be a business pro project um, and that there is both the business and the technical um, aspects to it and that has there has to be a lot of collaboration around that so I guess a couple of questions around you know governance and leadership um, one is so f for the folks in the audience who are from the technical side, what can they do to help um, 
engage their business leaders to if they're if they're not viewing it as a business project or they're not as engaged as they should be what can can the folks from the technical side do to help them become more engaged well it's easy it would be easy for me to say don't take no for an answer um because i'm not the one in your situation but my answer is uh, don't take no for an answer so <laughs> it's absolutely critical so you know and, and, and a related a related question is sort of who does this? Who's supposed to be the leader of the project? I'm agnostic about that. Depends on the organization, the way that, you know, who, who conceived of the project and how it evolved and how it emerged. And it can come from all different levels and sides of the organization. And there's a lot of stories that came from the executive or came from someone in the middle or came from the data scientist or came from the operations person. Um, it varies like mad. But the fact is, um, what... <laughs> What I'm advocating for is to follow an understood collaborative business practice that's end to end from conception to deployment. Um, and if it's not being followed, that's a big problem. It's sort of, if, it's, if you're following it, you're doing the right proper planning from the get go of exactly how operations are gonna change. And that's the missing ingredient. Somebody's gotta be running the project in that way with that kind of structure. So if not you, and why not you, by the way, think about that. But if not you, you gotta make sure it's happening. So one of the stories I tell in the book is, you know, when I was uh, early in my consulting career and I've been an independent consultant for 20 years now, um, I had a online dating uh, business and I got them to hire me to do and they hired me to do some number crunching and some data reconciliation. And then I was like, let me do churn modeling because we can predict which of your paying premium level customers are going to cancel. And they're like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. And they were doing well. They had a lot of cash. So I got paid. And and then when I uh, showed them the model on, in a PowerPoint, and in this sense, the power is stuck in PowerPoint, right? And I'm like, look, this is what could happen when you deploy it. And they're like, oh, cool. That's, that sounds interesting. And I'm like, so you're going to do it? They're like, are we going to do what? I'm like, you know, you're going to. So it was that was the conversation. This is what happens over and over again. They're like, you have to you want us to start a whole new operation, in this case, a, a new marketing campaign, a retention marketing campaign by predicting which customers are going to cancel. Um, so there was this disconnect. And so I was at fault because I even though I'm only the data scientist, I'm the one who sold the project in the first place. Right. And I hadn't anticipated um, you know, what it would take to convince decision makers to actually make an operational change. And in this case, a, a whole new initiative. Um, and what's worse than that is I didn't learn my lesson. My next main project that I had worked really well, but not because of me, because the people who hired me already had a really good plan for how it would be deployed. I got lucky in that regard. It took me a while to learn this lesson. This is, and this is, so there's, there's inertia, right? People are fixated on this awesome technology. I'm a former academic. And at that point, as a green consultant, I was in love with the technology and sure I still am, but now I'm more in love with getting it actually deployed. Great. Yeah. And, and you did also just answer uh, Peter's question. So um, we'll, we'll uh, so there's, there's a couple there are a couple of questions coming in around value. Um, you you defined, I think you clearly laid out that everyone's got to define their own value. What is it that you're trying to predict? Mm -hmm. And then how do you measure it? Um, so there's a couple of questions. One is from um, Sangwon asks, so the comment is, it's hard to evaluate business values immediately after deploying AI. So what do you mean by proven and how long does it usually take to get there? Like what's what's the right sort of, time frame for measuring the value that's a that's a great question i mean it depends on the operation right if you're doing uh if you're changing the targeting of ads it could take hours right before you know how many people are clicking on ads um so that could be really fast uh if you deploy a, a, a campaign a direct mail campaign that's better targeted with a machine learning model you know depending on the context maybe a few weeks or a few months um, you have to find out and give them time to actually respond to customers to respond and then see how it goes. So there's a sense where you have to wait until after deployment to see how well it worked. But the practice is, of course, to stress test the model and give your best estimate of how valuable it could and should be to forecast its potential value before you decide whether 
and how to deploy it. Um, and in that regard, we need to already move to those business metrics. What matters for a marketing campaign? The overall profit of the campaign, that's often one of the measures. Profit, ROI, number of, of customers saved, number of dollars saved for fraud detection. These are really, really obvious things. This speaks, this is the lingua franca of, of business. And it's unfortunately, strangely, still not the language of data science. Although in, in that survey I mentioned, um, uh, it turns out data scientists generally understand this, right? They, when you ask them, what's the most important metric, they start with those business metrics like profit and yeah. ROI in their lists. But then when you ask them, which are the most common metrics that you actually use, they say technical metrics. It's partly inertia, it's partly um, uh, cultural, but it's also a lack of sort of common practice and a lack of technology. I'm actually co-founding a company called Gooder AI to actually address that so that we can be evaluating models with those business, term, with those business metrics in addition to uh, technical metrics. So there's what happens inside companies and then there's what happens within the ecosystem of vendors and, and consulting companies as well. And Eswar asks, how do you see platforms and products evolving? And on the other side, how are organizations or service providers maturing in terms of framework methodology that weaves together the imperatives that you're talking about um, with their products and platforms? So it's kind of a market question. Um. Yeah, I, I got. Well, sorry, I'm not. I'm not quite getting the gist of the question. You, could you read it again? I mean, yeah. Um, so, so the first part was about how how do you see platforms and products evolving, but then the the so I think the meat of the question is how are organizations or service providers maturing in terms of framework and methodology that weaves business imperatives into their products and platforms. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just couldn't parse it the first time. So uh, <laughs> a lot in there. Um, yeah, certainly I'd rather answer the second question first because my focus isn't on platforms and products. My message, my clarion call today is to be focusing on business process. This is an organizational problem first and it's an organizational project first and a technical project second. Yes, there are technical problems. Uh, if you want to integrate, I mean, if you've got things serving ads in real time or making fraud de uh, detection decisions as far as whether to authorize a card transaction in real time, that operational system now has to actually get changed based on the score output by a model. So in real time, it needs to evaluate the model there and then and then make some decision based on the output of the model. So there's real um, uh, infrastructure issues and deploy, you know, um, structural issues. But again, I, I see those as the secondary issue to the broader, like the, the, the dog that wags the tail has got to be the organizational point and the practice, the, 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 the project management practice, because if you're following it, then you'll properly plan. If there's a deployment stall because there's a lack of the right technology, it's because it wasn't foreseen and planned for from the get-go. So that's the advantage of starting very clearly, not with just with the general business objective. And uh, most people already know that. Yes, you have to start with, uh, you know, your objective is to retain more customers or decrease the cost of, of, of uncaught fraud or whatever the objective is. That's great. But that's literally only the first of six steps that I outline in the BizML framework. Um, you then have to go into the detail to the end of that, including exactly what's predicted and what's gonna be done about it and how is that gonna be operationalized. So let me put it this way, the book's six main chapters outline those six steps. You can't just read step chapter one and be ready to do step one. You also have to read chapter six to understand what in deployment fully entails because it's those nitty gritty details you need to jump into from the beginning in terms of, oh, how is this gonna deploy? What's it gonna change? Do we have the right engineers? So we have to plan for that. So in terms of that second question of how are organizations and service providers evol evolving in terms of a framework, uh, so far not that great, but hey, the book just, just published on Tuesday. This is why I wrote the book, right? Because, and, this, and maybe more importantly, this is why I coined the wonderful buzzword BizML, five magic letters, business practice for running machine learning projects, because there is no well 
branded notion that's out there and well known to business stakeholders about even the need for a particular uh, business practice. So that's what I'm trying to get out there. I would say no, it's not going well. We this is this is the change I'm I'm asking the world for because routinely, especially outside of big tech and some very particular leaders, projects are failing to deploy. So back to um, inside the organization and keying off of something that you just said about the project management piece, Jessica asks, product managers sit between business and technology. How have you seen this role influence ML projects? Do you find that including product managers increases success with that skill set? Um, yeah, I would say that uh, learning the semi-technical, getting semi-technical understanding uh, is necessary. I'm not claiming it's sufficient, right? I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's really a, a holy grail or a, a panacea, but in the very least, you need this. Um, in terms of sitting between business and technology, pro, pro, uh, product manager for business analytics projects in particular, sometimes it's called the analytics tra uh, translator. There's a few other kind of relatively new kind of role descriptions and names. Um, but arose by any other name, we need this translation to happen. Whether it's a third person sitting in the middle or it's just two main people, it's the deep collaboration, right? So I, I, I find it difficult to prescribe exactly the structure of the humans uh, because it varies so much and the needs vary so much from organization to organization, project to project, whereas the process remains the same, or at least the required uh, fundamentals of the process, if you're gonna get that, there does tend to be a disconnect because there does tend to be sort of two types, data and business person. There is there is a continuum between the two, but it's, it's very much a bimodal distribution, right? And even if everybody in the company is super technical and has a master's degree in machine learning, um, the fact is when you're executing on the project, if you're in the weeds, if you're actually doing the data prep and modeling, it's very hard to be doing that and also keeping in, in your keeping seeing the forest for the trees and keeping perspective. Very, very hard. There's a reason we collaborate and call, create these things called companies, which are groups of organ, people instead of operating in a vacuum alone. We need to collaborate. You need to have people in different roles. So the roles are intrinsically gonna have sort of data and business sides to one degree or another. What's at stake here is the lack of a connection between people in those roles and the need to collaborate deeply, not on the core rocket science, not necessarily, I mean, it's great to understand about um, internal, internal combustion. And I know the principle of internal combustion, even though I don't know where the spark plug is in my car. Um, so you don't need to get into the weeds of the algorithm of how it learns from data, but the general principles are there. More importantly, you need to know how to operate the vehicle. You need to know those um, semi-technical pragmatics and get involved in those at a level detail for the, each particular project. So let's build on that for a bit. What, what's the best way for someone to ramp up so that they can participate in ML projects. So, so what's the first step? Where, where do they start? And I know they can read your book um, and learn a lot there, but but really what is it? So break it down to that, where to get started. Okay, I can't say read my book. <laughs> well, we were, I just said yeah, okay. that. So. Take, take my course. No, um, uh, you know, I, 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 um, I just got interviewed uh, about one of the five books I recommend in machine learning. And there's an article that just launched, I think this week. <clears throat> and they told me I couldn't recommend my own book. I was like, oh, right, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> um, two of the, uh, two of the books on that, on that list are in the same category. In general, it, there's far and few between books and material and courses and content on this level. This is, this is a missing ingredient because it's so much more comfortable for a data scientist to focus just on that number crunching part. And it's so much more comfortable for business people to sort of operate at a higher level of abstraction, which I kind of call, you know, buzzword city. Um, uh, but we need to bridge that chasm. So, you know, 
it's in the same thing with courses that I'm familiar with. It's few and far between that get into that, that untreaded, un, uncharted territory, which is somewhere in the middle, right? I mean, what I'm referring to is semi-technical, um, to business stakeholders, it may at first seem super technical. And to data scientists, it'll seem like high school algebra. They'll be like, whatever, that's not technical. Why are you even using the word technical? Um, there's a spectrum. And the spectrum's really wide or long. And so there's this middle area. Both sides need to move towards the middle. So I wish that I had um, more resources and I also uh, to point you towards. And I also wish there were more successes. So assuming that someone is coming from the business side and uh, was trying to get that understanding, working with their colleagues in the, in the organization, um, the question is, how, how can I convince data scientists to explain things more clearly? Like, what is that? There, there's a translation challenge in a lot of organizations. So what can someone from the business side do to gain that understanding with their technical colleagues? You know, um, Another way to sort of tell that story is the data scientist says, hey, look, I made the model that you wanted to predict misinformation or fraud or whatever it is. It has, look how good it is as an area under the receiver operating characteristic curve of 0.89. Isn't that exciting? And then the stakeholder is like, what? You know, can you translate that to English? Oh, well, it means it's predicting a lot better than guessing. Oh, okay. So, but how much value is it going to generate if I actually deploy it, if I change operations according to it? Data scientists are not prepared to answer that question. Um, but if you point them to yesterday's slow management review article where I'm like, look, it's just the, in the, the, the article, you have to go to a sidebar that pops open at the very bottom, but it gets into that same arithmetic I flashed on your screen today. The data scientist is going to understand that. Someone needs to hold their hand and be like, please would you now now you can just translate this it's not it's not impossible it, it it's just a willingness and a, and a change to culture um they need to be convinced no technical metrics are not sufficient you need to also provide an estimate of business value in business terms so there are a couple of questions coming in around data and one of them is from raquel asks eric what is your view on using synthetic data to train predictive models? That's a, you know, I need to ask if anybody can help me because I, I've seen it. I haven't spent a lot of time on it, but everything that I've seen about synthetic data, I'm like, huh? I don't, somebody needs to explain to me the synthetic data can think because the only thing that could be generating the data is, is the model. So if you already have a model, how could the model that you generate from the data be any better than the model you had in the first place? So I don't get it. I, that's where I'm at. Maybe there's something I'm missing. If anybody find me on LinkedIn, tell me what I'm missing. Point me to the article that, that, that'll explain to me uh, the value of synthetic data. I mean, data is expensive, especially when you have to manually label it, like for, is there a traffic light in this picture? Uh, very expensive and also bad labor conditions for the laborers. Uh, the labelers in many cases, right? So that's a question. And a lot of people say the solution is synthetic data um, because it can be generated automatically. I'm like, if it can be generated automatically, you don't need to model on it. So I, I don't get it yet. Uh, I think there might be something I'm missing. So uh, we have time for just one or two more short questions. Eric, another data question. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. I didn't actually capture it, but I remember it. The question was around, can you use the AI to clean your data? So, you know, we know we need a lot of data to train models. Can can the model also help to make sure that that data is the right data and it's it's accurate? Um, probably in some situations there 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 already is uh, an intrinsically circular logic problem just the same as with synthetic data there in a way right um but let me let's just take a step back the word noise can mean two different things it can mean uncertainty or outright incorrect values and the inputs to the model um only help predict so well right we don't have the ability to predict perfectly it sort of goes to chaos theory you can't predict whether somebody's going to click buy lie or die with really high confidence but you can predict a lot better than guessing and that translates into business value um 
and another, what that means is that you can you can there sort of feels like there's this randomness to to the to the values and the way they associate with the outcomes. Um, but that randomness, even if the data is totally sound and there's no errors, the randomness is because we have limited knowledge as humans and always will. So what appears to random is just is this uncertainty that comes out of a a, a, a lack of complete understanding and knowledge. Um, from that respect. There's not really a big difference between noise in the sense of incorrect value and just normal uncertainty and uh, uh, um, a lack of understanding in general. And because of that, machine learning methods are really robust to noise. If the noise I'm talking about is in the input variables, the things you're predicting from. But as far as the thing that you're predicting, the output of the model, what's called the dependent variable in the training data, you know who's going to cancel, whatever the thing is you're trying to predict, um, that's where you can't have noise. And the model's value and, and reliability is going to completely hinge on, um, excuse me, that's where you can't have errors. So you, you need to make sure that that data is sound. And that is just pragmatic. It's reality. It's empir This is empirical science, and that's the empirical part. If it's wrong, it's wrong, And but it's it needs to be ground truth, or there is no truth that you have access to. So there's no way for another model to, to determine that in general. Now, there may be some creative uses of generative AI where you kind of say, hey, look at this distribution. You know, can you can you tell me a probability that this is noise? And it may help target uh, human activities that investigate where there may be um, bad values, something like that. Well, you just teed up the final question quite nicely. Um, we, we can't have any sessions on AI these days without talking about generative AI. And um, Heather asks, how does this paradigm change when you layer in generative AI? While it is grounded in classic machine learning, the output is very different. It is, although you can also use, you can use generative AI, and we've done some studies on this of, um, to as a predictive model, just the same. It's like, what are the chances this statement is misinformation? You can basically, in one way or another, ask it that. Um, uh, and it may perform even better because it's a language-heavy task. But more generally, um, generative AI, where let's say you're using it to create first drafts of writing or of code, um, a very different kind of um, apples and oranges. Uh, but broadly, the same kind of framework needs to apply. You need to reverse plan. The antidote to hype is focusing on concrete use case and concrete value. You need to plan from the get-go exactly how it's going to operationalize, which practice, which process, uh, you know, such as writing 100 letters a day to customers need, could stand to be improved. You need to evaluate it with pertinent metrics. How well does this particular language model work with these employees doing this particular task? How often does it create new errors? You have to proofread everything as a human, human in the loop. Um, so there is generally the same kind of theme, but this ML is very much about the predictive use cases. Predictive is where you stand to improve most of your existing large scale operations versus generative where you're creating basically first drafts or writing or, or images and video and this kind of things. Um, very different they both build on machine learning which learns to predict right in this case you're predicting for each what word should i write next or what token really um or how should i change this pixel while i'm in the process of uh generating this image um so the core technology of learning from data to predict very much the same thing um but just used in a very different way um well that's so, great eric yeah yeah, um, th this has been such a great session, so much good information, and of course, lots more in the book, which just published this week. Um, so thank you so much, Eric, for being here with us. My pleasure. Thanks, Abby. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks so much.